Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good news you are coming to the, the real expert on history here tonight. Our next speaker, our principal speaker, is not just an Irish historian, he's a broadcaster and university professor. And I'm going to give out a bit of homework before he starts at all. Because my instructions from the committee are that when he concludes to speak, he concludes speaking, I will invite questions and comments from the floor. So I expect you all to be on your best. Get out your notebooks and prepare those questions. We're going to have a chance to put a few of them to him later on. It's a great pleasure to introduce him to you this evening. Uh, he is, as I say, a person who's written over a dozen books on the subject of Irish history. Uh, a person uh, who you've probably seen on TV quite a bit over the course of the last few years as well, as we had the commemorations of 1916, the formation of our state, the Civil War, and all of those, all of those matters. He has been a constant feature of television and radio uh, in terms of marking those centenaries and uh, speaking with great um, information, great insight into all of them. He's um, a man who graduated from UCD. He was a lecturer in modern Irish history at UCD in 1996-1998, a senior lecturer in Irish history at St. Patrick's College in DCU, and he was appointed the professor of modern Irish history at UCD in 2008. It's interesting to note tonight he attended, he attended St. Benilda's College in Kilmacud in Dublin uh, before graduating in UCD. Would you please welcome our keynote speaker tonight, historian, broadcaster, and university professor, Dermot Ferreter. It has been for so long. 
It can't be reduced to a single form. It certainly cannot be reduced to uh, simple morality tales. But it is one of the great formative factors in modern Irish history. The scale of the exodus, the constant movement, what it meant for those who left, what it meant also for those who remained behind. 60 years ago this month, there was much celebration of the arrival of the American President John F. Kennedy to Wexford. John F. Kennedy's visit to Ireland in 1963 was regarded by some of his American contemporaries as an extraordinary indulgence in the midst of some much more serious matters. But John F. Kennedy was also attuned to the emotional soundtrack that I referred to earlier on. The need to address the difficulties of Irish history and of Irish immigration. And as, almost as soon as he arrived, he mentioned that eight of my grandparents had left these shores in the space of almost as many months and came to the United States. No country, he said, in the history of the world has endured the hemorrhage that this island endured. It was an interesting choice of word, that word hemorrhage. It was pointed, it carried an edge. There were some somewhat cynical journalists traveling with the President of the United States who suggested that Kennedy was attempting to establish himself as a man who was racy of the Irish soil. That he was trying to place the Kennedy hut in Wexford alongside the famous log cabin of Abraham Lincoln. But in truth, of course, his words were very appropriate. No other country had experienced such a sustained depopulation by the second half of the 19th century. One of the great historians of emigration, David Fitzpatrick, suggested that by that stage in the late 19th century, emigration had become a massive, relentless, and efficiently managed national enterprise. Between 1846 and 1852, 2.1 million people fled or left this country. 1.8 million of them went to North America alone. In a very short space of time, the population of Ireland was cut by one third. But it wasn't the beginning, and it wasn't the end. And we have to be conscious of the much wider context of exodus, of emigration. Take the long view. Between 1700 and today, in the region of 10 million people have left this small island. Almost twice the population of the Republic of Ireland today in 2023. That 10 million, of course, exceeds the Irish population at its historic peak of over 8 million before on Gertham Moor. Oliver Goldsmith, of course, was a part of that exodus. He came off the boat and travels to London in 1756. London by then was cosmopolitan. It was a teeming, overwhelming metropolis. And Goldsmith wrote to his brother-in-law, Dan Hudson, referring to how vulnerable he felt as an Irish man in London at that time. He said that he was without friends, without recommendations, without money, without impudence. And where being Irish is sufficient to make me unemployable. But there was grit there too. He was resolved not to have recourse in his own words to suicide's halter, or what he referred to as the friar's cord. He was determined to try and resist the feelings of depression. David O'Shaughnessy, one of the editors of a collection of Goldsmith's letters, has highlighted the anecdotal evidence that Goldsmith during his time there was also very kind to those who had newly arrived from Ireland. This shy immigrant from the Irish Midlands who ended up buried in the heart of London's inner temple. And he was conscious of his Irish heritage all along. 
He was conscious too of the networks that he had to build in order to succeed. We get the interior voice of Goldsmith through some of his correspondence during this period. The battles for material survival, even amidst considerable literary success. The need to blend his recollections of Ireland with his experiences of contemporary England. The themes that he addresses in the deserted village. The sense of exile, the loss of that vital connection to the land. He was conscious too of Ireland's failings, of how it didn't treat learned men, as he put it, well enough. But of course, he never forgot Ireland, because Ireland remained very much a part of him. There was nothing inevitable about the success of Oliver Goldsmith. The success came initially with the publication in 1764 of The Traveller. And the Irish, of course, knew much about travelling, then and after. In the century after 1820, five million people from Ireland emigrated to the United States alone. In 1890, two out of every five Irish-born people were living abroad. Today, there are perhaps in the region of 65 to 70 million people worldwide who claim Irish descent. In the region of 40 million of them are American. But since the 1920s, emigration had been primarily to Britain. And that was one of the great changes over the course of the 20th century. 1.6 million people emigrated from Ireland to Britain during that 20th century. Twice as many as emigrated to the United States. And yet we don't refer to the Irish British in the same way that we refer to the Irish Americans. It's a reminder of the complexities around ethnic identity wrapped up with emigration. Ethnicity didn't assume the same status in Britain for the Irish as it did in the United States. And all of this, of course, is complicated. Some of our great historians of emigration, including uh, Kirby, Miller, Kirby Miller in the United States, have looked at how the emigrant narrative was framed around the idea, particularly the famine emigration, of exile and banishment, rather than a quest for opportunity and self-improvement. In truth, of course, it was a mixture of all of those things. And what about those who might benefit by staying at home? There was more land to go around, the consolidation of farm holdings, the opportunities that the famine created for those who were lucky enough to survive it. It was important politically for nationalists to develop a particular famine narrative, of course, and understandably, about eviction, about exile, about banishment. There's also, of course, the importance of survivor guilt, and the degree to which that is embedded deeply in the Irish psyche as a result of the trauma of that period of the mid-19th century. We need to be conscious of the relevance of all of these social, political, cultural and economic themes. They were relevant not just during that period, but for a long time afterwards. They were relevant even after the era of JFK. Ambassador Thomas Kiernan, who was the Irish representative in Washington at the time of the visit of John F. Kay, suggested that with his visit, we could mark the end of the Irish famine chapter. The idea that the return of this Catholic Irish American president, the first Catholic to be president of the United States, was in a way a compensation for what Ireland had experienced during the famine of year. That this was in a way about some kind of reward. There was a degree of truth in that. And yet we have to be conscious of all the coded language that we associate with emigration. With the wariness around the idea of being triumphant about the effects of something that were still being felt in the 1960s. The population of the Republic had dropped to just 2.8 million by 1961 even though things were beginning to improve at that stage. When we look at some of the famine era correspondence as collected by the historian David Fitzpatrick, we get the idea of the oceans of consolation 
that Letters from Home could provide, and that was the title of his landmark book on this subject, The Letters of Emigrants. He published that in 1995. That phrase, Oceans of Consolation, came from Michael Norma, who was from West Clare, who wrote back to his father to tell him how much consolation he got from his letters. The importance of those distinctive little yellow envelopes that were coming home to Ireland in the aftermath of that emigration. The gathering at the post offices as the mail was being opened and sorted. Who had got a letter from the United States? Would it contain money? Would it contain tickets in order for the migration to continue? We know from another historian, Arnold Schreier, that between 1848 and 1900, $260 million was sent home to Ireland from the United States. That would be the equivalent of about $150 million every year in today's terms. One Donegal set of parents of emigrants were quoted as saying, with the £20 that was sent home, we were able to pay our debts and raise our heads. <coughs> and it's a reminder of that economic safety valve that was such a feature of these remittances home. Kirby Miller also tells the story of a Roscommon father who was somewhat disappointed when the post arrived. It contained pictures, photographs of his children in America. I don't need to see photographs of my children, he complained. I know what they look like. I need to see the pictures of Abraham Lincoln. They being the pictures, of course, that adorned the dollar bills. <laughs> We also have the question of choice against that of exile and banishment. The letters that David Fitzpatrick highlighted would suggest, of course, that not everybody was forced to emigrate, that there was an impulse to be adventurous, to explore, to try and find things beyond the confines of Ireland. There were a variety of different reasons why people left. But there's also those who had no option. One in ten people in Clare, for example, was evicted as a result of the famine during that period. And we have to be conscious of the complications too that were created for the host communities. Consider that in February 1849 alone, some 200,000 Irish people arrived in Liverpool port. Most of them, of course, on their way further afield. But not all of them made it, and many of them stayed there. What did it mean for those host communities? Particularly when those Irish were regarded as importing, importing copery and disease and intemperance, the sectarian tensions that arose as a result of these kind of movements. All of these things were still very much a part of Irish folklore, Irish experience and Irish memory when JFK visited 60 years ago. The Irish Independent suggested in 1963 that with the visit of Kennedy, it was a killer blow to a national inferiority complex. It can convince us that we can do, or what is done by exiles, can be done at least as well by us at home. We can achieve, we can succeed. There was still a rawness around that, however. In the previous decade, in the 1950s, 412,000 people had left the Republic of Ireland. There were stages when there were more women than men emigrating, particularly in the late 1940s. So these contexts are vital for our understandings of that period, that long, long famine legacy. And it was political, it was psychological. It killed a higher proportion of population than any other natural catastrophe anywhere in the last three centuries. The historian Joe Lee has pointed out that as a result, the famine must be considered one of the building blocks of modern America and the making of America. But the nature of Irish power in the United States as a result of that was complicated. It was uneven. We often focus on the eastern coast of America. But the Irish were in San Francisco before they were in Boston. A skillful game 
of political management was needed when it came to assimilation, integration, and power. The depth of the anti-Catholic sentiment that existed had to be dealt with and overcome. There were many Irish exiles who developed a very strong sense of Republican purpose when it came to the cause of Ireland. They weren't always able to convince those in power, even when they were politically successful, that they should back the Irish case for the creation of an Irish Republic, partly because of the complications of the special relationship between Britain and the United States. There was also the challenge of trying to sustain an Irish identity abroad. How do you deal with the discriminations, with the ghettoizations, for all those who succeeded in Tammy Hall and those who were able to climb the greasy pole of local politics? What about those Irish who were white in colour but not necessarily in status? Yes, there was ghettoization. Yes, there were accusations that they were spreading again in temperance, popery and disease. They were also, of course, competing with other immigrants. 11 million Africans were shipped to the Americas between the 16th and the 19th centuries. Perhaps not enough of us know that some 40% of African Americans claim some Irish ancestry. That would suggest a degree of coexistence, of cooperation, and even more. You also have those who became frustrated by what they regarded as the confinement that their Irish identity was leading to. Even someone as wealthy and as powerful as the patriarch, Joseph Patrick Kennedy, the father of John F. Kennedy, expressed frustration about being Irish. God damn it, he said. I was born in this country. My children were born in this country. What does someone have to do to be American around here? And it remained a source of soreness for him, despite all his success and, of course, the political success of his sons. These multiple identities were very much a part of the experience of being Irish in America. But JFK's election, of course, was groundbreaking. The Irish-American writer Peter Hamill was later to write in 1999 about the impact of JFK's death later in 1963 on his Peter Hamill's father. He was the shining prince of the Irish diaspora, JFK. My father's grief, he wrote, was real for immigrants of his generation. The election of JFK had redeemed everything. The bigotry, the slurs, the sneers, and yet it was clear during that period of history that the African Americans were being treated much more harshly. At least the Irish could vote, they could attain citizenship, they could serve on juries, they did not experience segregation to the same degree. There was a qualitative difference between the Irish experience and the experience of the African Americans and indeed the Asians who emigrated to America during that period. There had been a belief in the 1840s that Ireland could back the cause of the abolition of slavery. We had a very complicated relationship with race and empire as a result of our entwinement with Britain. Victims of colonization but also a people who played a part in the imperial project, in imperial expansion, because of those entwinements. Consider Frederick Douglass, the best known black abolitionist of the 1840s and beyond in the United States, when he traveled to Ireland, introduced by Daniel O'Connell in Dublin, who referred to him without any modesty as the Black O'Connell. Frederick Douglass later reflected on his experiences in the 1840s in Ireland. I found that I was not treated as a colour, but as a man. He found that experience liberating and gratifying. And yet later, two decades later, he was able to write about the racism of the Catholic Irish. There was no class of our fellow citizens 
that has carried this prejudice against colored people to a point more extreme, he wrote, than the Catholic Irish. <coughs> the era of the draft riots in 1863 in New York. The lynching of African Americans. Being cheered on in some cases by Irish people. Those who were policing those draft riots, many of them too were Irish. Some 20% of the New York Metropolitan Police were Irish in the late 19th century. One quarter of all people in New York in the very late 19th century were Irish. So again you can see the multi-layered experiences, the complexity, how things can change and shift. But what doesn't change of course is the sense of displacement, the sense of dislocation. The words of JFK 60 years ago were also striking because there had been such a palpable public silence about emigration in Ireland in the decades after the famine. There was a tendency within the nationalist press in, press in the early 20th century to refer to emigration as a policy of peasant extermination. Ireland being economically exploited as a result of British misrule. Arthur Griffith, the founder of Sinn Féin, insisted in 1917 that Ireland could sustain a population of 16 million more people than the 4 million that were there in 1917 if only it had control of its own economic resources. The desire was not just to replace the pre famine population, but to outdo that. There were also the practicalities and the double speak around emigration and what it meant. The French travel writer Louis Paul Dubois visited Clifton in Galway in 1908. There were 3,300 families in Clifton at that stage. He reckoned that 10,000 pounds per annum was being sent home in remittances. That that paid for half of all of the rents paid by those 3,300 families in Clifton at that time. Emigration was also briefly mentioned during the War of Independence period. Sinn Féin, as an underground government and parliament, passed a decree banning emigration from Ireland for the duration of the War of Independence on the grounds that it was vital that young Irish men and women remained at home in order to fight the battle that had to be fought. But during that same War of Independence, W.T. Cosgrave, as the Sinn Féin Minister for Local Government, reflected on some of the children who were being reared in workhouses, that detested symbol of the famine era and its excesses. People who are reared in workhouses, he suggested, as a rule, are no acquisition to civil society. Their highest aim is to live at the expense of the ratepayer. It would be a decided advantage, she finished, if they all took it into their heads to emigrate. What constitutes valuable citizenship during this period? It would be invidious to single out W.T. W. Cosgrave as having been particularly uncharitable. He was of his time. They were products of a Victorian era. There was a harshness in the way they wrote about these children. And yet part of the logic was that those children would be afforded a better opportunity abroad than they would be at home. That was part of the mentality of that era. But you could also argue that it was another indication of the desire or tendency to try and export Irish problems rather than trying to deal with them at home. There was also a reluctance, of course, to take in refugees, particularly during the Second World War. A very hard-line Department of Justice in particular from the 1930s onwards in relation to that refugee question. There was also fear, we know from the archives, within the Irish government at the end of the Second World War that Britain would begin to tighten restrictions and impose restrictions when it came to the migration of Irish people to Britain. There was also a fear that up to 100,000 Irish men and women would be, in the words of the Department of the Taoiseach, dumped home after the Second World War. Not being necessary for the British wartime economy anymore. 
No doubt many of them, this memorandum went on, will have imbibed a good deal of leftism. And it's a reminder of another kind of safety valve. What if all of those young Irish men and women had had to remain in Ireland during that period? Would it have been a very different country? Would it have led to protests, to more demands for social change? Did it add to the conservativeness of Irish society? as a result of those kind of exoduses. And what about the pregnancy migration, which was being commented on by the Diocese of Westminster, writing to the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin, John Charles McQuaid, why are we dealing in London with the welfare of young pregnant Irish women? Why isn't the Diocese of Dublin dealing with young pregnant Irish women? But it was also, of course, an indication of the anonymity that some were seeking by traveling abroad, of the freedom, of the liberation that some of them felt, but also the great fear and stigma associated with what they were going through at home. There was a commission on immigration and other population problems established by the Irish government in 1948. It was a reaction to what was regarded as an existential threat if this depopulation continued, where would Ireland end up? This Commission on Immigration and Other Population Problems sat from 1948 to 1954. It sat for so long that some TDs raised questions in the Dáil about whether the members of the Commission themselves had emigrated. <laughs> and when it delivered its report, its 383-page report in 1954, it was not emotion. It was factual. It was a very valuable exercise in terms of documenting the history of Irish emigration and some of the reasons for Irish emigration. Whether it was a good thing or a bad thing for Ireland, it decided in its own words it was idle to pursue. It looked at the whole question of diet and clothing and housing and land reclamation. It also briefly discussed the idea of imposing a tax on Irish bachelors. It's an awful pity that tax was not imposed. <laughs> if only for the outrage and hilarity it would have caused as revenue officials chased these bachelors up the hills. But nonetheless, they were alluding to a very, very serious matter. The birth rate, the marriage rate. Take the figures as they existed at that time. If you look, for example, at women of marriageable age, only 73 per 1,000 were getting married, compared to 145 per 1,000 in the United States at that time. That was one of the reasons why a noted theologian in Notre Dame, John A. O'Brien, published a collection of essays under the title The Vanishing Irish in 1953, with another version in 1954. And it caused quite a stir because it suggested that if the rate of depopulation continued, the future of Ireland was clearly at stake. And there were many essays in that particular collection that alluded again to this bachelor problem. One of the contributors, Brian McMahon, the great Kerry school teacher, writer and playwright, was denounced from the altar for the harsh words he expressed about the segregation of the sexes in Ireland about the excesses of lectures and denunciations of what were regarded as, by him at least, as normal relations between the sexes. He wrote to an American correspondent about the fantastic nonsense that was being scouted from the altars during that period. And he said the countryside was crawling with ancient spinsters and bachelors. <laughs> and what did bachelors want, according to the editor of the book, John A. O'Brien, he wrote an essay on it. He said they didn't want love, they didn't want romance, they didn't want passion, they didn't want intelligence, they didn't want character, they didn't want wit. They wanted the plain, homespun qualities of wife and mother. Is it any wonder so many women were leaving? <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
this report of the Commission on Immigration, as I mentioned, was factual. It didn't necessarily offer an ethical or social analysis. But there were deep cultural implications that were apparent in the work of some younger writers in particular in the 1950s. Consider the work of Tom Murphy, for example, in his play A Whistle in the Dark. This idea that there were so many who were unfree in a free Ireland, who felt they did not have a stake in the country, who felt they had no option but to leave. This is alongside, of course, the Irish tradition of landholding and the inheritance uh, of the farm by the eldest son and what it meant for the rest of the family members. But the violence in the language of Murphy's plays is very revealing about that sense of dispossession, that sense of not having a stake in the country. It was also, of course, about class. Catherine Dunn has written powerfully about Irish men and women emigrating, continuing to emigrate to Britain during the 1960s. Many found the British a more tolerant people. And the money, of course, continues to remain relevant. We know that in 1961, there was 40 million, 14 million pounds spent on primary and secondary education in Ireland. And it's estimated that same year that 13.5 million was sent home in emigrants' remittances. That was in 1961. This is not just relevant to Ireland. It was relevant to Turkey. It was relevant in particular to Israel when it came to what the diaspora sent back and what it meant for the domestic economy, what it meant for subsistence and survival, and perhaps more for those who remained at home. So it did remain very relevant, and that was one issue, of course, that had been so uh, obvious in the 19th century. But there was still a tendency to deny the state's responsibility for doing something around emigration. Sean Lamas in the 1960s was not keen for state funding of voluntary organisations that were engaged in emigrant welfare work in Britain in particular. And it was often left to the church and church activists to get involved in emigrant welfare. We can't have this subject, according to Lamas, swamped by emotionalism. There was also concern about the political views of Irish emigrants in the United States, particularly after the outbreak of the Troubles from the late 1960s, and later on the activities of Norwood. Some of those Civil War emigrants were still very much involved in the politics of Ireland in the United States. Take the women of Common Amman. We know that in West Kerry there were 257 active members of Common Amman during the War of Independence and Civil War period. Of the 257, 106 of them left for the United States in the 1930s. 30% of the West Kerry IRA emigrated to the United States in the 1930s. And many of them, of course, held on to their dream about a united Ireland. It was causing frustration for those who were trying to discourage the idea of funding a campaign of terror at home. And the distance between Ireland and America complicated that. And there were campaigns, too, to try and regulate the situation of the undocumented Irish. They weren't illegal Irish. They were undocumented Irish. And that was very much a deliberate choice of language when it came to distinguishing between one type of immigrant and another in the United States. As I mentioned, this is psychologically complicated. We can draw on the songs that we heard so powerfully sung. We can draw on the literature. The writings of George O'Brien, for example, in his book, Out of Our Minds, where he talks about the 1950s experience of an emigrant, of sliding, as he put it, between one self and another. Or what Donald Foley, writing about a similar experience, referred to as the comradeship of adversity that was generated between emigrants. Later, we had the poetry of a Van Bold. Like oil lamps, we put them out the back of our minds, the back of our houses. John McGarren was also interested in emigration, particularly because of his brief experiences on a building site in London in the 1950s. And he described an encounter with a Clare man who had been working in Britain for decades, he was a seasoned operator on the building sites. And he was told that the weather in Clare, where he was from, had been particularly bad that summer. 
and he was delighted. Good, he said. May the rain never stop. May they all have to climb trees. May the water rise higher than it did for fucking Noah. <laughs> that was an acute cry of homesickness. And it could be expressed in that forceful way. In some respects, emigration, as sociologists would point out, was central to the Irish experience of being modern. And yet it also, of course, came with that significant psychological complication. We also have to be conscious of the way in which this matter was dressed politically from the 1990s onwards. Mary Robinson's decision as president of Ireland in 1995, for example, to address the joint houses of the Oireachtas on an issue of national importance. This is not something that is done by an Irish president very often. And Mary Robinson had decided that emigration was an issue of national importance. The use of the word diaspora was to be encouraged as far as she was concerned. Until then, the use of the word diaspora had had quite a restricted and specific meaning. It usually referred to the dispersal and exile of the Jewish population, their forced attention in Babylon. And yet the argument was being made by Robinson and others that there was forced dispersal of other people. The African slaves that I mentioned earlier on, or the Irish famine victims. The scarring historical event that framed particular countries and particular parts of the world. Mary Robinson later recorded that her address on Irish emigration was not well received. I could feel the resistance she wrote as I was speaking. This was not regarded as a political priority by those she was addressing. There was also a political context in relation to whether or not Irish emigrants should have some kind of access to the franchise. Should there be a vote for Irish emigrants? How could that be managed in relation to the Irish diaspora? There were those then and those now who preferred not to go there in relation to the complications that it might give rise to. And yet Ireland was clearly out of step with so many other countries when it came to the denial of the vote to Irish emigrants. You also, of course, had contemporary reflections by those who were dealing with an aging, aging emigrant population in both Britain and the United States in particular. I'll give you one example from the Camden Irish Centre. Father Jerry Kibben, who was very involved in emigrant welfare work in Camden. What we are finding, he said, are deep wells of human sadness. A degree of isolation that was being experienced, particularly around areas like Kilburn, for example, in the 1990s. Developing from that was the idea of our second national debt. What was owed to those who had been forced to leave in previous decades. A safe home campaign to see if elderly, vulnerable uh, Irish emigrants, particularly from the 50s, could be brought home. But that, of course, did not come without its own complications. And finally, we had the great historical role reversal, where Ireland becomes a host population. By 2002, 10% of those living in the Republic were non-Irish nationals. I still remember in 2008, there were 20,000 Polish people who were registered to vote in Ireland. I remember seeing them queuing up to vote in their domestic elections in Dublin in 2008. It was a reminder of how Ireland was changing. But it also posed a question for me, another what if question. If Irish immigrants had been able to vote in New York or Coventry or Birmingham, or Boston in the 1950s, but that had a transformative effect on our politics at home. I also remember going to see a play by the vibrant Nigerian actor, Bitsy Adigan, who staged a play called Paddies of Parnell Street, which was based on Jimmy Murphy's play, The Kings of the Kilburn High Road. All of the cast were African. And Bitsy said simply, if you want to understand what Africans are going through in Ireland today, you need to see this play, this Jimmy Murphy play. The message in it, the argument went, 
was universal. There were also debates about citizenship. Should there be an automatic right to citizenship for those who were born in Ireland? Ireland was exceptional in granting that right. And of course, a referendum changed that automatic right in 2004. And yet we also had a determination to open Ireland's borders to the new EU members after 2004. And there were tensions, there's no doubt about that. These are linked, of course, to economic development and economic decline, to availability of housing, to all of those complications around assimilation and class and where migrants can end up when it comes to host societies. With the economic crash, we had a new wave of emigration. There were some 200,000 Irish, 200, Irish nationals who left between 2008 and 2013. About half of them, if not more, were to come back. Many of them were quitting jobs in order to be afforded a better quality of life abroad. There were new destinations like Canada, Australia, the Middle East. There were suggestions that these were lifestyle choices, in the words of the Minister for Finance, Michael Noonan, that caused something of a storm during that period. It was a reminder of how politicians have had to tread very carefully when it comes to their public pronouncements on immigration. Brian Lenehan Sr. got himself into trouble in 1987 for giving an interview in New York in which he suggested that sure we can't all live on a small island. This was something that was not to be seen as a landscape of loss. And for all of the changes in technology, in the ability to communicate, the arrival of the internet, in Skype, later Zoom and cheap Ryanair flights, you were still dealing with this, those age-old themes of pain and dislocation. There was in 2002 an all-party anti-racism protocol when it came to the general election of that year. A recognition that there was potential for complication when it came to this question of multiculturalism and racism. We've had more reminders of that in recent times. There was a national consultative committee on racism and multiculturalism that was one of the victims of the crash not so long ago. We need it back. We need to think about these questions. We need to think about the question posed by the sociologist Brian Fanning, a colleague of mine in UCD, who has written extensively on migration to Ireland. How long can we rely on this weakness of the far right, the opportunities to manipulate the situation? By 2011, you could see that there were 544,257 non-Irish nationals from 199 different countries living in Ireland. There's been much reference tonight, of course, to the recent events. It's over 12% of the population now from those different nations. The ESRI also identified in 2013 a sharp rise in opposition to immigration. And again, that was linked to the change of economic fortunes. We also have to be conscious of direct provision, what it has meant and what it continues to mean. There were, in 2011, 1,250 applications for asylum. Contrast that to 2002, when there were nearly 12,000 applications for asylum. Many of them, of course, were left there far too long. I'll give you one example of an interview of one of those in direct provision. Mugugo Mafu fled from Zimbabwe with her six-year-old son in 2006 after her husband was killed for his political activities. We, she said, are being turned in to helpless, institutionalized zombies. And she talked about the crushing of their dignity that came with that. We should be conscious of the vulnerability of those in limbo. We must understand, for we, as a people, have seen enough of it. Always, I would suggest, consider the plight of those who are vulnerable and in limbo. Of those who are, in the words of Goldsmith, without friends, without recommendations, without money, 
without impudence. A reminder of why the words of Goldsmith, as they were written in the 1750s, still resonate today when it comes to this complex question of migration. Sadnesses, I suppose, around immigration. That's why we call it the Irish Wake. So many of those departures were final. 
even though there might be an acceptance at the time that you know they'd never see home again. That's been one of the big changes uh, in in uh, immigration that you know people will come home. They were also more educated. A lot of those people who, who emigrated during that period were highly educated. I remember being asked by the president of UCD to address the class of 2009 um, when they were graduating to give them a message of hope. I said, thanks very much for that now. <laughs> so, but I did talk about that being one of the big differences, that you know that they were uh, privileged to have been educated to the level that they were, uh, and that that would make their experience very, very different and, and give them opportunities that mightn't have been available. Uh, to, to previous generations of Americans. Yeah. Can I throw another one at you? It's probably a bit unfair, but I think a lot of people are fascinated by this. We have 80,000 people from Ukraine in the country. How many are going to stay and be part of the society here? This is the great thing about being a historian. I only have to think about the past. I don't predict, <laughs> I don't predict the future. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's a very serious question, and I imagine uh, a lot of them. But that's very complicated for them, uh, for obvious reasons. It might not be feasible for so many of them to go back, or practically possible. Uh, others will have built lives here uh, and, and established roots. And again, it's actually the continuance of the themes that we were talking about, about you know these kind of sliding between you know different identities and different lives, and, and, and how do they manage that dislocation, uh, whilst also perhaps being afforded opportunities. Uh, that, that come with moving, you know, but you know, you're always going to be carrying that sense of you being, particularly in this circumstance, being wrenched and forced from your home place. And again, those themes of, of banish, what are banishment and exile, really? Thanks very much, Kieran, and thanks, Dermot, for your presentation tonight. Uh, as a member of the co current government, I suppose I, I'd ask a question in terms of despite what you have said tonight and the long-standing uh, rich association Ireland has with emigration, all that has ha happened in the past. Um, I was struck by a poll in last Sunday's Independent, or one of the Sunday papers, in terms of where 70% of the Irish people have now said that as a country, we have taken in enough people coming in to this country. And I think we haven't. And despite the challenges we have in terms of housing, health, etc., we have both a legal and a moral obligation uh, to do more. Um, and I suppose there's an onus on the government to do more in terms of uh, advocating the positives of what we're doing. And I'd ask you maybe for your opinion in terms of what more the government can do to alleviate the fears of Irish people in terms of the number of people coming to our shores at the moment. Maybe I'll add a bit to the end of there. You mentioned the left. The, the actual uh, uh, use of, of, of that, that stat by some people in society who, who are turn, trying to turn a yeah. conversation, turn an argument yeah. uh, for, the, for the close the doors yeah. entirely. No, I mean, th th this is inevitable. Um, you have a situation that this is by no means an Irish question, obviously. Um, what we are seeing now are, are the consequences of a, a very large number of people coming in in a short space of time, uh, at a time of great difficulties in relation to, to housing uh, that we're all very well aware of. Um, at the same time, uh, we have to consider what Ireland has done in the context, in a much broader context. We've done a hell of a lot more than a hell of a lot of other countries. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the scale of the effort, um, and you could say, and I would say that, well, that's how it should be especially given what I've been talking about tonight, that doesn't mean that we don't have to discuss the possibility uh, of being realistic about what can feasibly be done. You don't want people on the streets, obviously. You know, we have a situation, it's not just now about those who are coming from war-torn uh, Ukraine. Uh, you know, there are also parallel arrivals, um, those who are seeking refuge, those who are seeking asylum. Uh, there's huge strains there, obviously. Um, so it's not that people should be criticised for raising these questions. Uh, I think it's inevitable that people are going to say, well, is this unlimited? Is this unending? Uh, that's not an unreasonable question to ask. 
And that's where I think the issue of communications uh, and framing this uh, in, in, in the context of our legal obligations, our moral obligations, if you want uh, uh, to talk about that, but also relativity, you know, when we talk about difficulties that are being experienced as against what some of those coming into Ireland are experiencing, you know, that has to be, a, I think, a core part of, of, of the response to it as well. Uh, but these issues have always arisen for host uh, societies. And you can imagine the, uh, I, I mentioned a few times, the reaction to an event that suddenly leads to mass mobilization and where they go and where are they going to be fitted uh, and what kind of tensions uh, might arise. I mean, that's as old as the immigration question itself. Um, so I don't think, uh, it's not a question of shouting down those who are raising questions about how it's managed. Uh, but there's also clearly an opportunity for manipulation of this question by those who have a completely different agenda, which is a blatantly racist uh, agenda. Um, and that's why I, I think I mentioned that National Consultative Committee on Multiculturalism and Racism um, and, you know, discussion of how this is managed, because you've got to have communities involved in those discussions, you know. Thank you very much. Which of one second? Now I will grant you one moment. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Ferreter. Uh, he, he delivered a tremendous um, spiel there, very, very interesting. But I'd just like to ask him about local uh, seasonal employment by the Irish abroad. When did that start? How extensive was it? And how lucrative was it? for the recipient parties. Uh, specific, what type of seasonal employment? Um, agricultural labourers mostly from the west of Ireland. Can okay, we take another one way down here? Now that his hand up, I'm to ask a question. Oh yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. It is um, uh, a tremendous talk. I am more than likely to assimilate, but um, there's something you said, uh, I think it was the third last sentence you, you, you stated. You spoke about a lady from Zimbabwe uh, being subjected to the rigors of uh, direct provision, and she spoke about the crushing of her dignity. And uh, it alarmed me because you spoke earlier about the experience that Americans, it was the experience of Americans of a Catholic uh, objection to, to colours, and if I'm correct in that, and um, I wonder if there's still a possibility that the racism is endemic in the Irish uh, civil service. I knew he'd give us a good one. <laughs> Stir it up <laughs> on the back. No, Professor Fisher. I don't think it's a question of it being embedded in the, in the Irish civil service. Um, that quote arose from the Brian McMahon report into direct provision. Brian McMahon, the former judge, was asked to chair um, uh, a committee that looked into this question of direct provision and recommended, obviously, uh, significant changes to direct provision. And of course, there's a commitment there to get rid of it altogether. But they interviewed people, obviously, about their experiences. Um, so that's the kind of testimony I'm talking about, the personal uh, testimony. Uh, it's not that I, I don't think anyone within the civil service went out deliberately um, to, to design uh, a system that they could be accused of, of, of racism on the back of. Um, but direct provision was never meant to be a long-term plan or solution. But that's what it has become. And that's where the crushing of the dignity. And you're talking about people who weren't allowed to work, uh, who weren't allowed to cook their own food, uh, who felt that they were ineffective. Uh, incarceration um, with obviously no money um, so the, you know that, that that's the context for that and I do think that in the years to come historians and others will look back at direct provision and ask the question how the hell did we allow that to happen uh, and we've done enough of that in recent years in relation to our own institution uh, yeah seasonal migration um, there was a horrible Bothy fire in Kirk and Tillock in Scotland in 1937. 
when a number of young um, migrant labourers, seasonal labourers, um, were killed uh, because they were living in completely unsuitable uh, accommodation. And they were locked in effectively, they couldn't get out when the fire started. Um, and you were talking there about how far that stretches back. That was a very, very long tradition uh, that went back to previous centuries, that you would have, a, 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 for seasonal reasons, you would have hired in labour. Uh, there was a particular tradition from Donegal and Mayo uh, of, of those seasonal migrants going over. There was a, a, an interdepartmental inquiry into seasonal migration on foot of the Curtin, Curtin Tiller tragedy. Padre O'Donnell, the great Donegal socialist republican, was very vocal about this at the time, saying that there wasn't enough noise being made about this loss uh, of Irish life because they were they were poor west of Ireland, Donegal and, and, and Mayo people. Um, so it remained very much um, essential for the economies of Donegal and Mayo uh, right up to the 1970s um, when it came to the, you know, the physical need for potato pickers in particular before greater mechanisation. Uh, so yeah, it, 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 it was very much a part of their experience, but it was much more associated with those areas than others. Thank you very much. The chairman tells me to take three questions to finish with. So, these will be, we take three on the floor and we'll go back to the chairman to wrap it up. Thanks very much, Professor uh, Fartar. Surely there's a sizable cohort of the younger population in this country, in recent years especially, uh, going abroad to top up their education and to top up their work experience and uh, coming back to deliver better in terms of education, their own profession medicine, business, engineering, etc., etc., and they come back far better equipped for employment and to contribute more to the economy of the country. I think lifestyle choices was the phrase used by Dermot Early. Another question? Did someone else raise a hand? You all happy? Yeah, but is it Brian Lennon, I think you mentioned, was the person who got it. But I think again recently, very, very recently. How do we know? How do we know? No, I mean, this question, like, you're absolutely right, and we've got to distinguish between emigration uh, and short-term travel. Um, you know, it's an important distinction. Often when we, we talk about immigration and we talk about historically, we're talking about something that's much more long-term. Um, that's why the patterns have changed in recent times. There are a lot of young people who go out and who might be teaching um, in um, places where they don't have to pay tax in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they may decide that they're going to save for a deposit uh, for a house abroad. Uh, they may just want to experience a completely different culture. Um, you know, there are all of those reasons, and some of them are lifestyle choices. Uh, the difficulty of Michael Newman's remarks is that they came in the middle of an economic crash, um, and it was quite clear that the vast majority of those who were leaving at that stage were leaving because they couldn't get jobs. Uh, but of course, that has always existed in, in, in more recent times. Uh, and of course, travel is a lot easier. Uh, what we are talking about from from the earlier decades was something much more final uh, for a lot of people. And even when I talked about those letters coming home, how long a letter took to come home, you know, months across the ocean, uh, very, very uh, different experience. But yeah, politicians have said some maybe crass things over the decades about immigration. But at the same time, um, that's why there was a silence about it a lot of the time. Richard Mulcahy, when he was leader of Fine Gael in 1946, he described in the Dáil some of the attractions of England for Irish workers. And he was accused by some of his colleagues of being treacherous, uh, that he was talking down in Ireland. And De Valera got himself into fierce trouble in 1951, where he, uh, he quoted from this report on the, the welfare uh, of Irish immigrants that came on the back of a report by a Catholic charity that suggested that they were falling into moral laxity. Uh, and there were telegrams came in from Birmingham and Coventry to the Department of Taoiseach saying, the reason we're here is because your government has failed us. How dare you question our morality, you know? So it's it's a very delicate subject uh, often for, for, for politicians. Just be a picky student to finish up, but I'm sticking with one in here. How do we know how much came back from our area in these oceans of consolation packages in Clifton? How do we know? Do these Abe Lincoln do dollars head up into a bank sometimes? Does somebody count them? It's a very good question because we don't know what we have are estimates and they are only ever partial estimates. They're partly based on trafficking the transfers through the institutions that they were transferred through. But when it came to, you're absolutely right, when it came to letters 
uh, you know, that might contain a note. They were usually money orders, you see. So you know, the, 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 there's more of a trail there. But you're absolutely right. It's impossible to quantify exactly. Uh, and some of the figures that have been put on it uh, are speculation, I guess, let's say. We certainly do know the value of them because as a young man whose sister emigrated the, the year I was born in 1966, we were very happy to see the brown parcels and the envelopes coming back in, I can tell you that. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been, as I say, a most thought-provoking evening. I want you to put your hands together, please, for Gerrit Ferrell. Thank you for your attention and for your involvement. I'll hand you back at this stage to your chairperson, Arthur Collins.